Y'all heard that? Hello, friends. Welcome. As you come in, I want to invite you to mute yourself because we're doing a meeting instead of a webinar format. And that's just really helpful if you can do that. Also, it should have already told you, and I'll say it a couple of times, we are recording this. So if you don't want your face seen at all in the recording, feel free to turn off your camera. Um, for security reasons, if you want to change the name that comes up in your Zoom account, that's totally cool too. Um, and we're just really excited to have you all here. Uh, we're going to wait a couple of minutes as more and more people keep joining us. It's great to see you all. I don't know where you are, where I am. It's quite hot and humid. So if I start to look a little flushed, it's just the way it goes when we're dealing with climate change. Um, but it's really great to be here with all of you today. So again, welcome. I invite you to mute yourself for now. There will be a time for sharing later. Um, a reminder, we will be recording uh, a portion of this. Perfect, welcome, welcome. It's great to see so many wonderful faces. Great to have you all here. Uh, we are going to begin shortly. I invite you to mute yourself. And just a reminder, we are recording. If you don't want to be seen, feel free to turn your camera off. No one's offended by that. Um, we just want this to be a great, safe space of learning. And we'll begin in about another minute. So if you didn't get a chance to grab that cup of water, now's your chance to do so. Okay, we are going to get started. Um, just one point of housekeeping. Uh, Muriel, who's on this call, uh, Muriel is the admin director for CPT. Uh, she will be helping out with a bit of tech. So if you have some tech issues, feel free to message Muriel. And Muriel, I'm also going to ask if you can admit people as they come in while we get started. Uh, so one last time, please keep your mic muted for now. One last time also, just remember we are recording. I think Zoom let you know about that um, as you entered the room. Uh, we just don't want to catch anybody off guard. So welcome, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for our webinar on the front lines with Indigenous water protectors. My name is Rochelle Friesen, and I'm the Canada Coordinator for Christian Peacemaker Teams. For those of you who do not know us, Christian Peacemaker Teams, or CPT, is an organization that trains everyday people to work in local peacemaking communities that are confronting situations of lethal conflict, partnering with them to transform violence and oppression. Now, we want to begin today's webinar with a land acknowledgement. Uh, many of us in this webinar are watching or listening from various parts of Turtle Island. Uh, some people refer to it as North America. Uh, Turtle Island has been home to many Indigenous nations for thousands of years, and their land was taken from them through war, genocide, starvation, and theft. We all want to take an opportunity to acknowledge whose land we are on, uh, so if you do know whose land you are on, please type it into the chat. Uh, so for example, I'm currently doing this call from Takaranto, or also known as Toronto, which is the homeland of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, and the Windat peoples. 
if you don't know whose land you are on, uh, I want to invite you to do some research uh, this coming week to figure out whose land you are you are on. We acknowledge that some of us in this webinar, such as myself, is consciously or unconsciously invaders on this land. Some of us on this land are here as a result of imperial, imperial wars and actions that made our homelands unsafe to live. And some of us on this land are here as a result of our ancestors being kidnapped by imperial powers and our labor and freedom was used by the state to spread domination over the land. We acknowledge that through pipeline construction, government legislation, and gentrification, land dispossession has not stopped as racism and settler colonial practices continue until this day. We must all work together to decolonize Turtle Island. Therefore, our acknowledgement must go beyond words and into action. And it is our hope that today's webinar, which is gonna have some chance for discussion and reflection, will help us along the journey as we work to decolonize the spaces we are in. So again, welcome. From Greece to Algeria and across Turtle Island, wildfires are burning out of control. Our world is literally on fire, yet governments and corporations continue to build pipelines that exasperate climate change, poison the water, and violate indigenous rights. Indigenous water protectors are not only fighting for sovereignty, they are fighting for the health of our world. This summer, CPT has been very honored that we were able to be present at line three, as well as in Unistoten in Wet'suwet'en territory, standing in solidarity with indigenous water protectors. Just a little housekeeping before we get started, uh, again, ask that you remain on mute during the presentations. There is gonna be space later for discussion and breakout rooms. I'll give you a heads up when those breakout rooms happen. Uh, if you do accidentally unmute yourself, um, Mural and myself might mute you. Please don't be offended. Um, it just, it helps us keep the flow of the presenters going in case your phone starts ringing in the background. Also, if you have questions that we don't get a chance to get to uh, today, please email peacemakers at cpt.org, which we'll paste in the chat shortly. Um, and we will try and answer any question that you send an email to. So today we're gonna hear from four CPTers who spent time on the front line standing in solidarity with indigenous water defenders and protectors. There's Melody Shank and Ken Jones, who are at line three, and Emily Green and Steve Heinrichs, who are in, in Unistoten. Each of them will be sharing a story today about their experience, and then we will move into a time of breakout rooms, where we'll have time and space to reflect on how we can become better allies. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Melody. Melody uh, has done quite a bit of work with CPT, uh, both uh, at the Borderlands and also doing Indigenous solidarity work. So Melody, thank you for being here with us today and we look forward to hearing from you. Hey, thank you, Rochelle, and welcome everyone. Um, as Rochelle said, I have not done a lot of CPT work. Um, going to the line three was my um, second um, experience after the delegation I went on. I'm a retired um, professor of teacher education, moved to North Carolina um, from Maine about seven years ago. Um, so I am going to tell a little story about um, just the camp in general and what the accompaniment meant in the um, sort of the rhythms of that camp. As many of you probably know, along line three, there are five or six camps, all of which are led by um, Anishinaabe um, women and um, our camp, which was the Welcome Center, for, Water Protector Welcome Center was no different. Um, however, we were su surprised that when we arrived that there are also um, a group of the, the leadership group um, has a lot of um, European Americans um, in it as well. 
So the water, the uh, Welcome Center um, is, as it, it's um, titled, a place that people are to come um, who want to come to Line 3 and to learn about you know, what's happening at that particular moment. And it is important to know that every moment changes <laughs> um, there, and that's what we learned very quickly. Um, the particular camp we were on is um, um, on, at 80 acres that Winona LaDuke bought um, sort of with some for, foresight to buy land along the easement of the pipeline. And so she bought this 80 acres along as well as the trusted, um, as well as other land along the pipeline. So that allows people to be there without being confronted all the time anyway. Um, by law enforcement workers or um, other, you know, Enbridge um, subcontractors. So just as so that you can imagine this camp, it's a, a two sides um, along the Mississippi River is where we ended up camping. And on the other side of the road is the main part of the land where there's a house and where most of the gathering took place. Um, what I wanted to talk about is, is sort of the back and forth, up and down of the rhythm of the camp. We arrived on a day when the Indigo Girls were giving a concert. And um, so there were 150 people there along the river. The Indigo Girls were on the river giving their concert. We were anxious to find out what was happening. So we scurried on to find a place to camp. Most visitors camp along the river. And also to get oriented to what was um, the confrontations that had been happening in the last two couple of weeks um, there. Um, Enbridge was getting ready to drill under the Mississippi River at that location. And um, Winona and um, another indigenous leader had built a prayer lodge on the easement of the pipeline. The uh, Anishinaabe have religious um, practice rights. And um, so they put the prayer lodge there and there had been a lot of confrontation with law, law enforcement. Um, and um, there were people camping at around the prayer lodge. We expected that our accompaniment job would be to take the place of some other people that were um, sort of keeping that space um, and um, as it turned out, um, we learned shortly after we got there that Enbridge had actually um, drilled under the river already, much faster than people on the ground thought was going to happen. And um, there had been a lot of rumbling, but um, they thought that what was happening was they were um, pulling, they were taking the pilot drill through which then they use um, that the space that's, that's created by the pilot drill is then used to pull the actual pipe through. And so they thought that what they were experiencing was only the pilot drill, but drone footage showed that they had actually pulled the pipe through. So you can imagine people had a lot of, um, they had spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of emotional energy um, con in confrontation with law enforcement and Enbridge workers. So as you can imagine, they were, um, there was some um, disappointed, some shock, disappointment, shock that they, you know, like here we were and they did it anyway. Um, and so, you know, there was a, like this, uh, this heightened amount of energy. There was an Indigo Girl concert. The next day, most of the 150 people um, leave. And certainly the following day, there was hardly anybody in camp except the core team and a few of us who were, um, what we learned later, were long-termers. We were there two weeks and we were um, long-term um, campers. Um, that meant that the people left. Um, the core group was deflated. They went on a retreat. We were left to sort of hold up the the space, um, still learning what we were to be doing. Um, at that point, I was like, like, you know, what are we supposed to be doing here? And Cliff Kindy, who was the third person on our team, um, said, we just do whatever they need us to do, which at that point was wash dishes, help with um, food preparation and any other tasks that happened. And that's actually sort of the, what happened um, at the camp. We did a lot of um, helping out and, uh, and we did spend time um, guarding and being at the prayer lodge because they wanted presence there for 24, you know, 24 seven. 
Um, but that sort of that um, the need for somebody at the prayer lodge um, sort of waned as we were there and we started doing other things. They were concerned about security of the camp. So that meant they needed to have somebody at the um, gate at all 24 hours um, a day. Um, so we did some shifts um, late at night um, and enjoyed the stars and made sure that, um, you know, there weren't people coming into the camp who were not known. Um, so um, what happened in the camp was that on weekends, particularly, um, they would a rush of people would come into the camp. And this camp particularly is known for not having direct actions, but Ken's going to tell you about the direct action that we did par uh, participate in. It's really known as a place where people can rest and come and learn about line three and also to learn about what they're doing um, in terms of trying to um, learn about sustainable living and to try to change the way we think about uh, our relationship um, to um, the, um, the environment and to Mother Earth, and to learn practices like you know they're con they're doing com you know um, toilet composting. They have a garden. They have um, they're starting a community garden. They're thinking about different kinds of housing. Um, you know, thinking about different kinds of sources of energy. All of those things that um, Winona and other um, indigenous leaders are really trying to um, enliven. Um, for um, their tribes, but also, excuse me, also for um, all of us. Um, so there's lots of that happening, um, uh, learning how to, you know, make teepees and, you know, all those kinds of things. So what that meant was, is that many people would come for the weekend from mostly from the Twin Cities, descend on um, the camp. Um, oftentimes I think the core people didn't know. And that of course meant that there was all kinds of activity and sometimes incredibly good um, discussions. Um, so um, sometimes it felt like we weren't doing anything and sometimes it felt like we were totally engaged. Um, and I joked to Cliff that, um, you know, usually CPT activity, you get the big stories about all of, you know, um, things, whether there's conflict and really having to step in, but, you know, a lot of, he said, a lot of the time you're doing dishes and preparing food for people. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much, Melody. And I think, you know, you really highlighted um, indigenous sovereignty doing indigenous solidarity work takes a diversity of labor. Sometimes it's the flashpoints going toe to toe with the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police or, or the police, or sometimes it's doing a nonviolent direct action and chaining yourself to something. Sometimes it's documenting. Sometimes it's doing a lot of dishes. Sometimes it's digging a hole. Sometimes it's listening and being a presence for folks that are there. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing that and also highlighting the importance of longevity. Um, so it is great that folks show up for the weekend, but I also hear you saying that folks, we really need folks that can be there longer term. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from Ken, who is also at line three. Well, hi, everyone. Um, as you, my name is Ken Jones and uh, you might have gathered that Melody and I went together to line three and in fact, our partners. Um, so uh, our experience with CPT is not as extensive as probably many of you on this call. A um, couple years, uh, we went to the border together and, and now we've done this action up at line three. I did a training, in fact, with Emily in Colombia a couple of few years ago. Um, so what I want to share with you is pick up where Melody left off. Uh, mostly what you can see from what Melody said is that we uh, were into community building for the most part and, uh, and uh, sort of accompanying in terms of the lodge and the guarding and the meals and all that. But, uh, and this camp was different. The other camps are more prone for direct action and lockdowns and blockades and all of that. Um, and in fact, we did have one action like that in the two week period of time that we were there. And that's what I wanna share with you. Um, so uh, after the pipeline was uh, drilled under the Mississippi River, there's another river right close to this camp, the Willow River. And uh, that was the next place where they were drilling. And um, 
the people at the camp uh, recognized that it was time to do something uh, more active than, uh, than the prayer lodge had been. The prayer lodge was the action in terms of blocking the pipeline. And uh, now they meant to do uh, maybe some lockdown, maybe wasn't clear to us what it was because we weren't told right away. Um, but uh, all of a sudden, uh, within a day or so before this action happened, probably another 30 people converged on the camp from other camps people who were more experienced at direct action. And uh, real quickly, they gathered people into groups and decided there would be three different actions taking place all at once. And um, I actually feel honored and privileged that I was allowed to be in an action that uh, was led by uh, three of the indigenous women who are uh, leaders really throughout the state, Winona LaDuke, Tanya, and um, uh, Tasha, Tasha is what she calls herself. Um, so, um, so they decided, along with a few other people, there were 12 of us all together, to take uh, some canoes, to paint four canoes, and to haul them down into the river, the Willow River, and to uh, position the canoes between two drilling pads, right where the line was gonna go under the river to position the canoes there and stake it out and do a canoe in, if you will, to stay in the river. Uh, so that was part of three actions. The other two actions were happening simultaneously. We all went at the break of dawn in these pickup trucks down these dusty roads and two different teams got dropped off to do blockades. And there was one team that did a lockdown as part of the blockade into a truck that was in front of a barrier that was in front of where the workers go in. Uh, we went down to the river and uh, our intention was, uh, we thought we were there gonna get arrested because we were uh, blocking the line, blocking the work. Uh, but we weren't sure because the uh, river is actually public access. Uh, it's not private property like the easement is where the um, drilling is taking place. So we were unsure, but we were all prepared to get arrested. And, um, and it turned out it was a windy, cold day, raining. And um, so we were wet. We got into the river and we positioned ourselves and uh, waited and um, amused each other and talked to each other and tried to keep our spirits up. We were playing music and you know, there was a little line dance going on there in the Willow River. It was shallow enough that you can stand in it. Uh, and so um, some time went by while the other actions took place. And some of the people who took place in the blockades came by and, you know, said hello to us and moved on. They were wandering around the site. Uh, finally, some workers noticed us there. And along, of course, came the sheriffs. And so now we thought, oh, well, we're not gonna walk out of the river. We're gonna have them come into the river and get us, right? Um, but they didn't. Uh, they saw us in the river and they just let us be. Um, and um, so we, actually, I shouldn't say we, the indigenous women bantered back and forth with them uh, about uh, whose land this was and whose treaties rights these were and what these people how they were violating a law, not us, so forth. And so that went on for a while. And the sheriff stood there and basically watched us and didn't interfere with our just standing in the river. And um, so we, our expectations were uh, sort of like, hmm, okay, well, I guess we just stay here for a while and see what happens. Turns out we were there for about eight hours in the river. And uh, it was a bit of an endurance contest. And this is sort of a, the moral of this story. One of the morals of the story is what you plan for is not necessarily what you get. Um, so uh, one upshot of it that we didn't plan for was that it so happens that we got into the river right at the spot, of course, where the line was going through. And there was a large, what they call a frack out. And what that means is there was a spillage of fluid that they, when they do these drillings under a river, they drill through with some clay uh, liquid fluid that in this case broke into an aquifer and broke the pipe and leaked all of this clay into the river. And it's warm, we stepped right into it. 
It's warm and it was pretty massive, thick, gooey stuff, chemicals in it as well. So um, we took pictures and took water samples and um, we got out of the river by canoeing up the river away from the easement. So we, we didn't get arrested. Our intention was not, you know, we didn't especially volunteer to get arrested, although, you know, we were there expecting to be. So we got away without being arrested, but we did report this frack out and it turned out to be, uh, you know, quite an event. Uh, it shut down the drilling for like three days right there and it cued all the other camps to the possibility of frack outs. And at this point, there's been, I want to say like 15 to 20 other frack outs on all these other spots. People are looking for it and they're reporting it and they're taking water samples. And it's become kind of the edge that people are saying, look, they're polluting our waters. I think there's something like 10,000 fluid uh, gallons of, these, uh, of this clay stuff that's been poured into different rivers. Anyway, so that's the story of that, uh, that action. And, uh, you know, it turned out that it was uh, important, but not in the way that we thought it would be. Thank you so much, Ken. And I think you highlight something really, a few things that are really important for us. I mean, it's not about will these pipelines leak and pollute, it's when are they going to leak and pollute? And they're already at the construction point, leaking and polluting the waters. Um, that should be giving life. Um, and that's really important for us to remember. And also as, asking the question, whose authority do you follow when you're on indigenous land? Do you follow the indigenous water protectors or do you follow the police? And I think you showed a great example. When you're on indigenous land, you follow the owners of the land and that is the indigenous water protectors. So thank you so much. Uh, we are going to transition now to Northern Turtle Island, um, to so-called Canada. And I mean, these struggles are very interconnected. The pipelines, I mean, with the Turtle Island Solidarity Network, we aim to erase that colonial border and join in solidarity across borders. Um, pipelines cross borders, our Indigenous uh, accompaniment is going to cross borders too. And so we're now going to hear from Emily Green, uh, who was out in Unistoten in Wet'suwet'en territory, uh, where the Wet'suwet'en are resisting the coastal gas link pipeline. Uh, welcome, Emily. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here speaking with you all. I'm Emily Green. I uh, am a grad student and I am focused on thinking about um, how to bring more non-Indigenous people into solidarity with Indigenous people. What is it that, uh, are, what are some of the barriers to that? And what are some of the, the motivations to that? So that's what I'm really into nerding out on. Uh, so I'm so excited to be here talking with you today about these topics. Uh, so yeah, as Rochelle said, I was um, honored to be able to visit and support the Unistoten Healing Center. Uh, they continue to say no to the Coastal Gas Link uh, or CGL pipeline, just as they have said no to numerous other uh, oil and gas pipelines that have been proposed to go through their territory in the past, um, especially in the past decade. And uh, and so I'm going to focus in on one story in particular uh, that held a lot of learning for me. And this experience happened in one of our days off where when our group of supporters decided that we were going to go and take a visit to a nearby lake. So our group got into our van, we drove up the road not too far from the healing center and went to this lake. And when we arrived at the lake, we saw that there was a coastal gas link company, ve company vehicle parked there and two people sitting fishing out of the lake. The context for this is that throughout, for over the last year, year and a half of coastal gas link pushing through this pipeline on, on the Unistoten territory, on the Wet'suwet'en territory, uh, there have been repeated incidences of coastal gas link workers on their days off going and hunting and fishing on, on the territories. And the Unistoten people have said, no, absolutely not. We do not consent to you harvesting any medicine, harvesting any of the life 
from this territory. You are, you, we do not consent to that. You are not permitted. Coastal Gaslink, in an attempt to have a nice public face, probably, we'll assume, has, has said, okay, yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, we're gonna get our workers in line. We're gonna get our workers in line. We, yes, that is wrong. We won't do that. We won't do that. And yet these incidences continue. So here we are by this lake and the coordinator from, one of the coordinators from the Unistotin camp who we were with had a confrontation with these two guys and said, you do not have consent to be fishing out of this lake. We would like you to leave. These two guys did not respond well to this. And they said, well, we have British Columbia fishing permits. We're permitted to fish here. And so this coordinator says, you're not in British Columbia. You're not in Canada. You are, you are on what's wet in territory. These workers respond with defensiveness and say, well, well, where do we, where do we get our, our permit then? And the coordinator says, you, you speak to the the Unistotin matriarchs or the Unistotin hereditary chiefs for, for consent. And the, the guys are like, well, where do we do that? Um, and the coordinator responded with, you know, every time you drive to your work site, every time you drive to your man camp, you are passing the Unistotin healing center. That is where you go to get your consent. That is where you go to begin to build these relationships. And so these two, two workers were we're not happy with this and we're very defensive with this. Um, and I share the story because I want to share that it stirred something for me because I noticed that I was relating to the experience of the uh, CGL workers. I was relating to their confusion or their the, the, the way that they ha had so much had their, their fishing permit be normalized for them as a valid piece of authoritative permission on this land, that for them to be confronted with a different reality, with a different truth, with a different form of governance was very uncomfortable. And I know for myself that there are a lot of ways that the Canadian state and, and the settler colonial bureaucracy that is superimposed on top of Indigenous governance and on top of Indigenous stewardship and on top of Indigenous land, that is so normalized for me as someone socialized as a settler. I, I take for granted my passport, that my Canadian passport enables me to cross so many borders with, with relative ease, uh, that I access healthcare and education, roadways, clean drinking water, uh, electricity, from hydroelectric dams at, that are largely made on waterways that are sacred. And these, these, these energy sources disrupt so much. And, and I take that for granted. And I can often, like, it, it's often startling to try to question that. And, and I, I dream of a decolonized future. I dream of that happening now. And, and so I, I bring in the story of, of being at this lake and witnessing these two workers as they were confronted with this other reality, because I also recognize that there are gonna be times when decolonization is also uncomfortable for me and where I'm gonna struggle to really call into question things that privilege me, that give me access to things that make my life easier. And, you know, and it's gonna be, a, a there's going to be challenges in the transformations ahead, and and I I I want to have more conversation about about that and about embracing that and about asking the questions of of what we are willing to give up and to change as we try to create a future where all humans, like non-indigenous and indigenous, can live in a world that is not on fire. You know that where we can live together in justice and in peace. Um, and so, yeah, I look forward to having some discussions with you about that later. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Emily. And like, yeah, that tension again of when you're a guest on this land, how do you actually operate as a guest on the land? Do you respect then the Canadian bureaucratic authority that's coming on top of you? Or do you say no? I'm going to take part in this moment of decolonization and say the authority to me comes from indigenous water protectors. 
Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, next up, we are gonna hear from Steve Heinrichs, uh, who was also in Unistauta and in Wet'suwet'en territory. Welcome, Steve. Thanks, Rochelle, and, and thanks to the whole group that's gathered tonight to, to engage these stories. We are so grateful. Um, as Rochelle mentioned, my name is Steve Heinrichs. I'm zooming in here uh, from Winnipeg. I'm actually in my office. I, I work with Mennonite Church Canada as the Indigenous Settler Relations Director, and I'm lucky to be on the steering committee of CPT, and, and I've learned so much um, hanging out with the CPT community. So I went to Unistaten for one month. I went to support a community that's been defending their lands and waters from oil and gas since 2009. I was on the Yinta, the territory, for four weeks doing simple tasks, chopping wood, washing dishes, all to support the work of the healing center. The Unistaten, well, they've been mobilizing and sustaining a resistance on that territory for 636 weeks. That's a long time. The dedication and endurance that they've embodied in the face of corporate and state power is nothing but remarkable. They've been harassed. They've been misrepresented in the media. They've been surveyed. They've been arrested. And yet they keep on keeping on. 636 weeks protecting their millennia old homelands. That dogged commitment, that persistent love for the land is probably the biggest thing that I took away from my time in Wet'suwet'en territory. When you're up there, one hears and sees a particular teaching there at Unistaten over and over again. And that is, I could call on my friends here to say, what is it? It's heal the land, heal the people. Well, I think I'm, I'm growing in that understanding. I think that I know land is life and land is medicine. And I know there's so much joy in being in good relationship with the land. At Unistaten, around the dinner table, one sees plenty of smiles on the faces of land offenders. And one hears a lot of laughter. But defending the land in the face of such strident opposition for so very long, 636 weeks, that's hard work. It takes discipline and it requires sacrifice. And I can only imagine the emotional strength and collective conviction, conviction nourished by ancestors by sacred traditions, by laws that empowers one to do that sacrificial work. 636 weeks and counting. The resistance continues. And the pressures on this resistance right now are mounting. Yesterday, a news article came out stating that Coastal GasLink has significantly increased its workforce on the pipeline. At the end of May, when there were five of us who were up there, there were about 1,600 workers on site. I should say five CPTers who were up there. At the beginning of July, there were 3,400 coastal gas link workers. Right now, CGL has cleared 89% of the area in Section 7, which includes Unastaten and their neighboring Gitteman clan colleagues territory. Pipeline installation and grading have yet to begin, but that's scheduled to take place this fall. This fall, my friends. And this is like the last section to really lay down pipe in. The resistance continues and will need to ramp up. For 636 weeks, the Unistadna fought hard to stop this pipeline and other extractive projects in their sovereign territory. And we have to honor their incredible sacrifice, but we need to do so much more than lift our hearts and minds to these efforts. This week, as Rochelle mentioned, the global community received the latest IPCC report. And I'm sure your hearts like mine are just reeling 
from this. It is a red alert for humanity, as the UN Secretary General said. The facts are undeniable. Unless we stop all new oil and gas projects, unless we rapidly draw down current fossil fuel infrastructure, we are on track to blow past one and a half degrees Celsius by 2040, and the results will be catastrophic. Even if nation states live up to their current climate commitments promised at Paris, we're still hitting at least 2.7 degrees by the end of the century. That means in simple terms, mass suffering and death. It's unimaginable. Coastal gas link and the line three pipelines must be stopped. It is a moral and ethical imperative Defend the land, defend the waters, defend indigenous sovereignty, and defend our common home. I think we need to pray for those who are on the front lines, yes. I think we need to write letters to those banks that are financing these pipelines, yes. We need to lobby and hound our government officials, yes. But the situation is so urgent, and the time is really short for both these pipelines that we need to do more, much more. Big corporations and big government don't really care much about our petitions, to be honest. But they do take notice when we do go to the front lines and support indigenous resistance. And they do take notice when we organize actions in our own communities to disrupt their offices and their places of business and do it repeatedly. They take notice when we do as the Unastaten and the water protectors down at line three do, and that's sacrifice. Now I recognize we have different capacities and we're coming from different places of privilege, but whoever among us is able, even here in this Zoom call and those who watch this recording, we must step up to exercise costly resistance, even now. A few days ago, the Gitterman clan posted this call to action in response to the IPCC report. And with this, I close. Globally, we have less than 10 years to change the course we are on or we won't survive. We need everyone to take action. We're fighting for our clean waters, our territory that sustains us. We have allies and relatives fighting similar fights for their waters and their trees. We need all of us. In the coming weeks and months, we need boots on the ground here on our yinta. We need actions right where you stand and all the noise you can muster. We can still do this and we will never give up. So let's do this, friends, and let's not give up. Thank you, Steve. 636 weeks. People, Indigenous water protectors have put everything on the line to save their yinta, to save their land, and to decolonize Canada. Um, not everyone can go to the front lines, but we can all do something in our own communities. 636 weeks. I'm going to invite us to say, can we take as a community the next 16 weeks, so the next four months this fall, to take as much action as we can to be in solidarity with Indigenous water protectors, either at line three or in wet sewage and territory. Some folks get nervous about taking action. They wonder, are we prepared? Do I have enough information? I do want to let you know that CPT does have a three hour non-violence training that we do on Zoom. Uh, it goes by quickly, uh, it's very interactive, which can help prepare your community to take action. Um, also with some pandemic restrictions lifting, there is a chance uh, to be able to do some of these trainings in person. If you are interested in getting your community trained, you can either email peacemakers at cpt.org or you can email me directly, uh, rochellef at cpt.org. Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, 
is so powerful. Now, part of our work, and I, I know a lot of folks in this webinar, in this meeting, is from Turtle Island. And we're trying to figure out how do we do this work? How do we be allies? How do we show support? And that also takes reflection and study and community discussion. And so we are going to break away a bit from a traditional form of webinar um, and enter into small groups uh, where you'll have a chance to ask questions, to discuss, to reflect. That way we can prepare ourselves for the movement. 16 weeks, we got to put ourselves out there as hard as we can. Um, but we're going to first take a three minute break just so that folks have a time to personally reflect on the words that they've heard so far today. Uh, so we'll take a three minute break. I will then put you in breakout rooms. I also understand that not everyone wants to do breakout rooms and discussion, and that is fine. Uh, I'm not offended if you decide to leave, but I really do wanna invite you to enter this time of reflection. We are also going to stop the recording at this time because we don't want our time of reflection uh, to be publicized. We wanna be able to share authentically. So for later, when we share this video, thank you for anyone who watched this video, but I am going to stop the recording. Um.